All right. Well, hello, everyone. Good morning. Uh, welcome in. Today, we are going to do um, AP invoices. We're doing sort of a tips and tricks, like a deeper dive into AP invoices. So we're kind of just talking about a variety of things that uh, could be relevant when you're invoicing or uh, processes, reports uh, related to creating invoices. Um, I was looking back because we have done a tips and tricks before, and I pulled some of the same topics from that previous tips and tricks, but we'll definitely do some new things as well. Uh, so that was in 22. So it was kind of interesting to me to see, you know, we, like I said, we have some things that are different that we'll talk about. Uh, but the core thing that I'm going to kick off with is talking about reopening uh, invoices from prior periods. I know that's one that comes up a lot. So, uh, you know, and I think I actually talked about that a bit in the SSDT direct, like right to the districts too. And so I thought about it, I'm like, you know, I know that we've totally talked about this before, but I wanted to kick us off with it anyway, because that way, if you all have questions, you know, as you're going through, um, again, I know, I think that's one of the biggest questions uh, with invoices that um, it seems like you all get. So, all right. So where are we starting here? So um, I am on the USS documentation page and uh, let's go to uh, transaction AP invoices. And um, so here's our page for our documentation page for the actual AP invoicing uh, page within USAS. And uh, these sections here, reopen completely paid, close a partially paid, um, these are the topics we're going to talk about here. Um, and then there's some additional information here. I am going to be talking about the EIS flag um, as well at one point. So this is your basic landing page for um, invoices. But what I also want to show is, uh, let's go back to our USS documentation, is uh, down, if I scroll down to the appendix, boom, um, our FAQs. So uh, we also have a page and sort of the FAQs gives us an opportunity, whereas, you know, the regular wiki pages are, um, that's our user manual, right? So FAQ helps us put it a little bit differently into like, here's what questions may come up and here's a little bit of the context and then like link that back to like how the software works with the manual, but we can give a little bit more context here. So we have a whole section for invoices and um, this is where we have, you know, how can an invoice be changed from partial to full, full to partial, um, some information about credits, uh, and then we have um, dates. We're going to talk about those. And so we'll we'll be referencing quite a few things in this, in this se section today. But this is nice because, I mean, while we're all going to be talking about this here together today, in the future, if there's something that you get a question and you're thinking, oh my gosh, I remember talking about these dates. Uh, first of all, the training will be recorded and posted out um, and linked to the page that you signed up on, so you could always refer back to this. Uh, but second of all, you could come search these FAQs if you have a question um, related to invoices, and uh, we do our best to sort of keep adding to this as um, there are new things that come up. So, so that's my starting spiel. I hope everybody has some coffee this morning. Um, all right, let's get into looking at, looking at, um, our software then. Okay. Let me get logged in here. All right. So, um, once I'm in the use as instance, let's see, um, um, just checking my notes. So like I said, I want to start off with this one because it comes up quite a bit. And, uh, you know, slowly over time, we try and talk less and less about classic because I know we've all moved away from that. But, you know, one thing and I think a reason that this comes up and why we get questions is because, you know, a lot of our treasurers and our, you know, people in the in the treasurer staff who are actually using this application, like they did use classic for some time. And that's still true. So, um, 
it's it works a little bit differently in redesign the primary reason that i would attribute that to is because with the posting periods and the flexibility that you have to a reopen periods if you need to or b and primarily to run reports for prior periods so one of the things in the classic software you have to remember is every single time you closed a period all of that like actual data in the software was overwritten. It was cleared and reset for the next month. Then they had the monthly CD report. So they had reports they could look back on, but they could never actually regenerate reports for any old periods, um, unless you had like a backup copy that you were refreshing. But in their actual software, um, that's a huge, huge difference. And it's a huge benefit that we have with redesign. So while I totally understand when these questions come up, sometimes it's like, you know, people just want to be able to like, hey, I want to do this without reopening a period. Um, there are reasons that that's just not possible. And it's because we're keeping the data of those prior periods intact. And if you're going, if it's not going to be intact, if it's going to change prior periods, then you reopen it because that's acknowledging that it's going to change. Um, I'll talk about the alter alternatives too. Uh, my overall assessment with this is if you plan and you kind of know how this works, then it can help them come up with how they want to handle it going forward. So um, so that said, okay, so Amanda, hop in, let's look at transactions here. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll stop talking. <laughs> but uh, well, I won't stop talking, sorry. But um, I'll stop going on the spiel about invoices and period, posting periods. Uh, okay, so let's look at RPO first, and then we'll talk it through with this actual example. Um, all right. So here's my PO. Let's take a look here. So my PO is, you know what, let me zoom in a little bit for you. We're probably going to have to go in and out on the Zoom today with the things I want to show. So I'll do my best to keep that managed. Um, so my purchase order date is in February. This is a February purchase order. And uh, where this is right now, so um, here's my invoiceable flag. Hang on, I'm zooming back out. Uh, so here's my invoiceable flag right here. And um, that is not invoiceable right now. So it's closed. So this is a closed PO. And I can see that the original PO amount was for $2,000. Here, $2,000 on my line item. But the total paid was uh, $1,200. So this was paid, done, closed. Now, for our example, what we're going to say is like, hey, look, I didn't actually spend the entire amount on this. I closed it, but now it's June and I realized that I need to spend that other $800. So, I mean, I had this uh, PO created back in February. So, you know, so I want to just go ahead and reopen this. Now, let's go look. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to look at a couple different places for this. So the first thing I want to look at is the activity ledger. Um, I'll tell you when looking at an invoice in this kind of situation or um, there are various other situations um, that I've come across where uh, looking at looking at like any certain like PO activity on the activity ledger can be very, very helpful to give you a picture of what's going on. All right, let me just adjust my columns here. So, in this case, uh, I kind of just reset my activity ledger back to what you just get, you know, just to start off. Uh, I'm going to take some of these extra ones off of here. Um, but let's see, but uh, I do want to add on one. I'm going to add on status. And um, this one is going to help us, especially with invoices, this will help us show um, like full or partial status. So let me close that up and let that reload. Okay. And then let's put in our PO number. And I'm just going to scroll over. I'm going to drag over our type. 
and our status. Take them out too. Okay, let's see. There we go. All right. So this gives me like a pretty good picture of just sort of the PO activity so far. So what I'm looking at here on um, February 20th, the PO was created for $2,000. And then on the 25th, it was invoiced in full for $1,200. And then the disbursement was issued. So it was paid at that point in time. And because it was full, um, it said, okay, I'm paying it for the twelve, um, the 1200 and the 800 that was remaining, because it's full, that just gets taken off of the encumbrances. So that's what we're looking at. Um, all right. And then for good measure, we're also going to go look at the account. I want to um, show what the account looks like currently. Okay, so the account for that um, line item, I have written down here. So here's what we're looking at is um, it had, let's see, it had an expendable amount of 15,000. We spent the 1,200, that's the, that's the check that we just saw um, associated with that PO. And then it has another 5,000 encumbered from elsewhere. So that's the current situation of this. Let me take a little screenshot here. I'm just gonna save that off to the side because I want us to be able to come back and look at that. Or at least reference it. Okay, I got it saved. So, so that's where we're at now. Okay, and um, currently we are in June 2024. So when we're looking at this, we're looking at this through the lens of June 2024. Um, let's see, let's go to our posting periods. Now, how this works is because that was paid in full in February, if I make February current, I just want to go like look and see. So this is what the account figures look like as of February. You know what? I'll go back to that posting period page in a second here because I realized I did that pretty quickly. <laughs> uh, but so if we look at this, if you see in my top corner here, we're as of February. So I look as of February, this looks the same, um, but what we're seeing, the amount was expended because the disbursement was dated in February, and then the amount that's encumbered was that 5,000 remaining. Great, cool, you know, that's what would have been included in our February reports in the archive um, if we go back and run any reports as of February or any month in between, like that's how this PO specifically is going to be accounted for in those totals okay so um and i know we're kind of looking at some preliminary stuff here and i'm hoping this will kind of once we actually make changes that we'll go back and uh and and compare so uh just to just to come back here real quick um the in my posting period grid i just clicked the check to make february the current period so we we're seeing the totals as of that period on the account um, I'm going to go ahead and click June. And then that check mark. Um, so I didn't have to reopen February for that. I just wanted to view um, the the data, the current data as of the current period. So I'm changing it back to June. Uh, now let's go. All right. So let's go actually look at this invoice. You know what? What I'm going to do is... Uh, let me open another tab to look at the invoice. Actually, we'll leave we'll leave these posting periods here because well, we might be coming back here. So, uh, okay, so transaction AP invoices grid, and let me get my PO number. Okay, so here's what my invoice looks like. Um, again, that was dated February twenty fifth. 
and we can see that it is a full invoice. The item status is full. Again, that was for the 1200 and, you know, all dated in February. So what we want to do, the, the button you're going to use when you want to make um, an invoice change the item status here, you want to take an action and that action's over here. So I had to expand the window because I'm zoomed in. So it depends on, you know, your screen size, but that might be something you can either scroll or make the window bigger. But what you want is this button right here. Okay, so um, if I click this, um, I yes, I'm going to get an error because February is not open. Okay, and that's where I'm kind of going back in and talking about we're looking at these accounts and we're going to go back and compare so we can see what changes on the accounts um, because it's going to require us to open it if we want to go back and change this February invoice from full to partial. So let's do that. Um, and this is why I have my posting period window still open. So let me go back to February and I'm gonna open this. Let's refresh this page. This is our invoice grid. Boom, get that open again. Okay, okay, so now we can click our button and we'll we'll talk about the impacts of this and I'm definitely going there um because I know I just you know whoop, let's just open it up and I know that that's you know usually there's some conversation uh before that happens um but I want to show you like what this does and then we'll continue talking about um the options here so I clicked uh the action to change to partial and then the item status over here is now partial okay so as simple as that, that was like a pretty easy update to make uh, once we have the posting period open. I could, if I wanted to make it full again, I could just click this button, invoice updated, change it to full status, um, but we want that as partial. Okay, so let's look at what we did. The first thing I'm going to do is go back to that purchase order. Let's look at the purchase order now. So you'll see right away we can invoice this, which that was our goal. You know, we wanted to be able to pay on this again. The checkbox for invoiceable, it's now invoiceable, so it's open. I have a remaining encumbrance of 800. So by clicking that one little button, uh, you know, and reopening the period, uh, we were able to uh, reopen this and have a remaining encumbrance to pay on it again, which is very convenient. Um, Obviously, our example is in a prior month. You know, if you have, if the full invoice was in a month that was already open, like then, hey, this is the easy part, you know. Um, but uh, so here's our remaining encumbrance. And then if we wanted to, we could invoice and we could pay on this line again. All right. But now... Let's go see what we did. And when we start looking at the account, that's the context that I wanna talk about because that'll um, help us understand why we needed to reopen February, okay? So um, I'm gonna go ahead and leave this purchase order alone. Go to the accounts grid. And let's look at our account again. Now, I'm still looking at June right now. Um, we'll look at June 1st. Um, view this. Okay. So what we can see here, again, we started with 15,000 expendable. We, we actually expend, we still have that disbursement for the 1200. So that's great. But now that we've changed that to partial, we said, okay, as of February, we still had, this wasn't closed. We had 800 that we wanted to be remaining from a February purchase order. So that remaining $800, and we want to be able to spend that now, now shows in the encumbered amount, okay? And so let me drag this over here. This was before. So this encumbered, it was 5,000, right? But now it's 800. Um, and then let's take this one step farther is I'm going to go make February current again. Um, and we can close up February too. Uh, it doesn't really matter. Uh, yeah, let's 
let's close it. Okay, but let's, but we're looking at the numbers now. We're going to look at the totals as of February. And see, look at February. Now February is the 5,800. And so what we did is we originally said, as of February, the purchase order, so originally the purchase order was closed. I don't have any more encumbrances. I don't wanna have anything encumbered on the purchase order. I don't wanna have anything encumbered on the account for February, for March, for April. Any reports, any purchase, any like purchase order reports, your budget summary encumbrances, because that comes from the account, your cash summary encumbrances, back to February now, originally didn't include that 800 because the full invoice told it that you don't need those anymore. Okay. So now that we're in June, if we want to say this was open all along, because that's what you're telling it. If you say, I want this to actually be reopened, I want this to have been open still, then you have to reopen February because in order to show that that was still open, it has to reflect as if it was open all along. Like it has to get those encumbrances from when the PO was created to current. And then what we're seeing here is, you know, that does change the encumbered amount back. Now we're within the same fiscal year. So this may not be a big deal. Your districts may be okay with this. Some of them, I know they're like, I'm never reopening a period ever. And that's fine too. Um, so, so this is the difference we would see. And again, I go back to like any reports. So I could go run, um, a report here. If I run like my budget summary, let it, let us put in our full account code. Um, I could get rid of this. I have this total as of period. So they could go look at like, okay, I, I want to look at uh, April. Let's get zoomed in here and see my encumbrance is the 5,800. It's included. And so... So that's where like the requirement to open the posting period, it's because of like how that would change figures to have it reflected that way. And the requirement to like, basically it's not going to let you change it if it's because it can't like, so I don't know, I guess what I'm trying to say is sometimes we get questions like they want to do this without having to open a period. And it's not necessarily as simple as that because the reason that it prevents you from doing it without opening the period is because it's something that's going to change numbers. So you have to consciously be able to make that decision because we wouldn't want you to allow, we wouldn't want to allow them to just change it and then have it actually be changing figures, you know, when they don't want that. So it's kind of a safety guard. Um, now let's talk about the alternatives here. Because we closed back up February. Uh, let's go make our current period June. We closed February back up. So now, um, say we're in like the alternative situation where we left it open in February. Um, instead of closing it, we left it open in February. And now we're like, oh, we don't actually need that. So one option, like you could go reopen February and change it to full that's an option. And then that would take the 800 off back to February. Or we could invoice this to cancel it. And when we invoice to cancel it, that will also close it. And we can also put a current period date on it. So like doing the cancel invoice isn't going to require opening any periods. So, you know, it's definitely not cut and dry because totally with the districts, like especially this time of year, I know that they don't just want to be like leaving POs open. Um, they want to, you know, close what they can. 
But if there are things that, you know, um, there are uh, POs, invoices that are questionable if they're going to get another one or not, you know, it may be worth, especially if they're very strict on not reopening prior periods, it may be worth having, uh, you know, going with the partial invoice instead of just closing it so that, you know, they could pay on it again if they think that's a possibility, you know, versus putting themselves in a situation where they're like, yeah, I might get one again. I probably will, but let me just close it. I'll just reopen it later. Um, so just thinking about how that process, you know, happens. The other thing is, you know, if they had that one from February and they really, they don't want to reopen it, um, the alternative is to make a new PO in the current month. Because then if you are going to be uh, creating the new PO, that's going to add the encumbrances as of the current month, and then they can pay them as of the current month. So um, that option, it allows them to just add new encumbrances without adding anything to those prior month totals. So that's another option. Okay. Uh, let me just check all of my notes here because I have quite a few. Um, yeah, I guess, I, you know, I've already talked about, I'm not trying to talk, uh, repeat myself or anything, but I just want to mention this because I have like a little bit um, of a different thought with it is, you know, that said, and like giving you, you all the options and kind of talking through this, uh, it really is up to the districts, like how they want to process, uh, you know, with this. I mean, generally, like what we see is if it's within the same fiscal year, that is definitely more common. I know that they don't want to go back to a prior year to do this. I think that would be unlikely um, to see that situation. Uh, but how strict they expect their auditors to be with their specific month end reports could play a factor here. Um, if they are going back and like in this example, we reopened February, um, if they are going back, I mean, they can regenerate their monthly reports, like even have like additional, you know, copy of the monthly reports that regenerate. Um, it would be for the month that they reopened and any month between to current. So that is important to note. So definitely could matter how many months back the invoice is. Um, and then, yeah, and I and I think the other thing uh, that I, I didn't, you know, flat out say, but I know that, you know, with creating the purchase order in the, like, you know, I said, well, the other options, they can just create one in the current month um, instead of going back and reopening. And I know sometimes that can uh, cause a then and now, and they um, may need to get that approved by their board. So, you know, I, I think that um, in some cases, then they're opposed to doing that. So I know that this, uh, this is why this one comes up and gets a lot of questions. Uh, my hope with talking through it is, you know, first of all, we got to see you click the button, here's how it actually happens, but kind of talk through what it's doing so that when these situations come up or even going forward, this can help kind of come up with a plan for maybe managing those invoices to kind of try and avoid this situation, honestly, if they want to not, um, not reopen periods. So, okay. Any questions about that before we move on? All right. Okay, let me go to our purchase order grid. All right, I'm, I kind of snuck this topic in here, but I've had a couple questions about this over time and I thought it would be helpful to talk out um, so, so we're just going to, we're going to kind of look at a couple POs and talk about the context of invoicing here is, uh, we've had a couple questions like, why doesn't the remaining encumbrance on a purchase order equal the original encumbrance minus the paid amount? So if we look at, um, let me see, I think it's this one, I'm a little zoomed in here. So we'll make sure we got that. Yeah. Okay. So I don't have anything paid on this yet. 
but we're going to walk through an example here. Uh, no, you know what? Let me edit my PO because I realize I messed this one up when I made it. Fix the other one, but not this one. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So sorry about that. So here, here's what I'm, what I'm showing. So we have our purchase order total. So this is our total amount. And then here's our remaining encumbrance. So at this point, we haven't paid anything on this purchase order. We had um, original, nothing paid. So we have everything still outstanding, okay? Now in this example, this is for some office supplies. We have an office desk, we have a lamp, we have a chair, all right? Let's invoice this because our desk, uh, our desk arrived. We got a new desk, everyone. <laughs> So um, our desk came in, we got the invoice for the desk. Oops, actually I don't need to, I'm gonna plug this in here. We got the invoice for the desk, but here's the thing, it was actually a little bit more than we made our original invoice for. So let's say it was 1,100, okay? So it was $100 more but it's full i'm paying for my full desk so we'll make our invoice me hope i didn't use that one yet looks good uh i will come back i'm going to talk about some of the other fields in here later but for the purpose of this example let's just roll through this invoice step so add an invoice number we went ahead and filled this out and let's save that up okay awesome um, I'm going to go ahead and, uh, create my check real quick. Let's just put, oh wait, you know what, before we do that, let's, let's look at, uh, let's look at the purchase order. Cause I guess that we can kind of talk about a couple things that happen here. This isn't my main point, but this is a good thing to see. So I've invoiced my total payable over here because it's just an invoice right now. I didn't disperse it yet is, um, this amount. My remaining encumbrance isn't going to look exactly correct. It's not going to come off of the remaining encumbrance until I actually post the disbursement. So uh, the payable is relevant here. You always want to kind of compare that um, when you have invoices that are still in this payable step. If we uh, check the office supplies, let's just get this posted so that we can actually look at it as if this has been paid. Okay, boom. So now let's look at our purchase order. All right. So when we look at our totals, now it's already been posted. And then here's our remaining encumbrance. And so what, what the question is that comes up here is if you look at our PO total, it's 1575 if you look at our amount paid, it's 1,100. If I subtract this, that's gonna be 475 remaining, right? But if I look at my total remaining encumbrance, it's 575. So we run into the question where sometimes they'll be looking at these POs and they're like, well, why is the total remaining encumbrance not a math equation of this? And in this example, we know we just invoiced it. It's because our desk cost more, but we still have a lamp that costs fifty dollars, and we still have an office chair that costs five twenty five. Just because my desk was more expensive, that doesn't mean that my lamp and office chair are now going to be cheaper, right? Like it's it's because these are separate line items. So each original encumbrance is going to be allocated each line item overpaying on one item is not going to reduce your other items. These could be associated with different accounts and those account codes are all going to be, all going to have, you know, the encumbrance on the account. So just because I paid on this one, like it's not gonna affect these other accounts that I have allocated um, amounts for. And when we look at an example like this, Hopefully that makes, you know, pretty good sense. You know, there's a reason we're looking at it like this because that you can kind of put that together, right? Where, um, you know, I have three different items and those each have different costs, okay? Um, but that's not all we're going to look at. 
because I have another one here. And if we look at this purchase order, so this one is for phone bills. And I lied because I didn't update the quantity on this one. So give me just a second. Uh, I just, I keyed these in earlier. So this was my mistake. Um, so when we look at this one, we have, you know, multiple line items for our phone bills that we've like set up and we're going to go pay on this. Uh, the other time that I see this is maybe like Amazon, you know, or like a credit card or something like that, where they have a purchase order where they have multiple line items. Sometimes they're even to the same account, but it's kind of something that they're paying over time. Um, and, you know, okay, so one month this comes in and I'm going to pay, you know, X amount. And I just, you know, I normally pay on line one, so I'm going to keep paying on line one. And in this case, the same exact logic for how these line items work applies. If I pay more on line item one, it's not going to reduce line item two and three. It's not. If I overpay, I pay more than what the original encumbrance is on this, okay? Because these, at the end of the day, they're separate items. You know, that's still going to work the same. But this is more of an example of the situation when the question comes up, because generally when people are asking this, they're just looking at, here's my, you know, here's my original, here's what I paid. In their mind, all of these items are like technically for the same purpose. So they think the remaining should be just a simple math equation. Okay. The other time that this can happen is um, if they have credits, if they, so they might like post payments to this purchase order, but then they get credits back. So they're posting negative invoices to like add back, um, encumbrances to the purchase order. So that's something to watch out too. Uh, if you get a question like this, I would say um, the activity ledger, go look at the PO on the activity ledger. Um, the first thing I usually do when this comes up is I'll go look to see if there are any negative invoices because that's a credit. Um, and then the other thing that you can do is you can run, uh, let's get our purchase number for this one that we made the actual overpayment on. The other thing you can do is run, it's called the impact on encumbrance report. I'm sure some of you are familiar with that. Um, oops, wrong button. It's fine, we'll generate it from here. So I only need to generate it once. Okay. So, uh, and sorry, I did that a little bit fast, but you know, when you actually go to run this, you can get your pop-up, you can just put in a specific purchase order number. So I just put in my purchase order number for this. And this gives me a nice little view where I can see each of the line items and I can see the calculation here. And what this is, so this is basically showing you the background calculation of the encumbrances. So uh, let's start from the bottom. Let's start from these other two here is both of these uh, two and three, we didn't do anything on those. So those were just, here's what the purchase order was. We added encumbrances by having a per by creating a purchase order with those amounts. On the first one here, what we have is the purchase order. It added a thousand, and that was our original encumbrance. And then what we're seeing here is because we overpaid this, it said, hey, we're actually going to go a hundred above the encumbrances. That's what this is. It's just a background adjustment. Like this, we didn't actually like, you know, there you won't see a transaction for 100. You'll see a transaction for one hundred dollars more than the remaining encumbrance because we did it for 1100 right? This is $100 more than the encumbrance. So this invoice um, transaction we're seeing on this report, it's basically just like a little adjustment that the system is doing so that when this disbursement is um, taking it, it can take it to zero. So we're, we're paying 1100 
and this math, math equation equals zero. Because the other thing that's important to remember is the remaining encumbrance on the purchase order cannot go negative. Just because we paid $100 more on this line item, we wouldn't want the remaining encumbrance to be negative 100. So this is kind of like the system accounting for that. All right. So those are things to look at there. Um, let me close this extra window too. Um, all right. Hopefully that example helps. I, usually when I see these, uh, they are more complicated. Usually it's not just, you know, like a one transaction thing. So if this comes up, I would say the important thing to remember, you know, just because it's the PO original total and what's been paid, it is normal that those don't always um, have, they're not always a straight math equation. And then looking for uh, looking for any overpayments or credits is uh, your first line um, to take a look at there for explaining why. All right, let's talk about uh, some of these um, rules. So uh, I'm gonna go to our documentation real quick. Oh, Valerie just had someone ask this the other day and it makes sense now. Oh, you're welcome. Good. I'm glad I'm glad that that helps. Yeah, we've got a couple of tickets on it. Once you once you like know where to look, it's pretty easy to straighten out. And again, like that the second example we looked at where it was the phone records, I'm like, I see why they think this, you know, the way that the purchase order is set up. I see why they think this. Um, And you know what? I know I was going to move on, but I'm glad you said this because I just that the other thing that I wanted to say was um, one way they can avoid it is um, so say they have that situation where it's like some sort of utility or something like that, um, but they kind of it's supposed to just be something that they want to continuously pay on. If they just keep it to one I one line item, then they could keep just paying on that one line item. Um, it's the act of splitting it up into multiple items that kind of makes it confusing. So that's like another thing where maybe like you know, knowing how it works, they can evaluate, like maybe they want to set that up differently next year uh, to avoid that situation. So I wanted to say that as well. Uh, the other thing is if they're using credits, so they're posting those negative invoices, um, if they're doing those where they're like posting credits and posting payments, uh, generally when I see it, it's because they posted the credit after the payment. So making sure that they're posting any credits first uh in like any one batch you know i know that it's not always they're probably um paying to it multiple times but if they have like a certain batch they want to post the credit first and then post the payment and that can help avoid like the overpayment situation okay yeah that was one more note i had i almost missed there okay now we'll move on to our system rules and I'm going to talk about a couple in these bundled rules that are not mandatory. Uh, I know there's a lot going on here when we're looking at this in the documentation. Kind of what I'm going to do, I'm going to scroll a little bit here, but we have these bolded sections. And so if we kind of scroll down, um, I'm going to scroll down to the ones that uh, have invoice in them. Okay. And uh, let's see. The first one I want to talk about is... Um, uh, amount invoice is greater than the remaining encumbrance. I thought that one was here. You know what? Let me just do this. Uh, I thought I had the rule. Sorry. I thought I had the rule in my notes. So when I guess I need to read these on the fly. <laughs> Well, next time I will not do that. Sorry. Uh, no, I'm in POs. Here, here it is. Okay. You know what? Sometimes when you're like, I'm like on a training and usually I, I have all my stuff noted in my notes. I'm like, okay, I didn't put the rule name in the notes. Of course, my search isn't working. Have that like momentary panic. Like, 
wait, does this rule exist? <laughs> but okay, this is the one I want to talk about. I'll try not to panic. Uh, right here, invoice item amount exceeds encumbrance rule. So invoice amount exceeds remaining encumbrance. Um, this is, it's an optional rule. It's disabled by default. But what this rule can do is it'll show when saving an invoice, um, if the amount that they're invoicing exceeds the remaining encumbrance amount on that line item. So uh, this is like, it's not exactly the same as what we just talked about, or like it can kind of help. Basically, this would prevent an overpayment on any one line. Um, one of the reasons that I bring this up after our last conversation is because like sometimes they're looking at this and they're like, they don't, um, you know, it, it's sort of thought to be like, oh, can this be like a solution towards the entire PO remaining encumbrance? Um, but the important thing to know is invoice item amount exceeds the encumbrance. So this is going to be specific to like each line item. If I had this rule enabled, then I could only pay 1000 on that um, invoice that I did. Well, sorry, it's a warning. It's not an error. So I would have gotten a warning when I went to go pay 1100 instead of 1000 on that desk that I invoiced. So um, if we go to our system rules, and let's do this. My I like looking up the rules like this. I'll just take the end part, copy and paste that. We'll put a little uh, wild card in there, and here's our rule. So if we wanted to turn this on, uh, what we could do is come in here, check enabled, save this up. And then after we save it, you want to make sure you click activate on the rules grid. So if the context of this comes up, you know, talking about these overpayment situations and they're like, well, we don't want, we want to make sure that it like tells us if we're going to overpay, this rule can give a warning that would let them know that. The other ones that I wanted to point out are these um, next ones here that are the, um, negative budget balance warnings. So we have warning, invoice budget, negative balance. Uh, so these rules, um, we had added these previously and there is still like a calculation um, error with them. So a lot of you may have already turned these off for your districts, but uh, basically the calculation was like not correctly accounting for the encumbrance like being reduced. Um, so if you get questions about these invoice, uh, warnings, like happening when they shouldn't, basically, uh, you can come in and turn these rules off. So invoice negative budget balance warning is this one. And then, um, negative cash warning is the other one, uh, right here that I have noted. We do have a JIRA issue to update those, um, to fix those, um, going forward. I know we had intended to, but with bugs, you know, sometimes other things take priority. Since these can be disabled, <laughs> that is a solution that um, you can at least use for now. And then once we get them fixed, they'll be um, something you could turn back on. All right. All right. Let's go back to our uh, purchase orders. So next, I just want to show real quick the um, the inventory flag. Uh, so we're going to go to this first one that I have here. Let's take a look. So let me make sure. Yeah. So here's our purchase order. Actually, before we do this, um, so when it comes to marking items for inventory, that is going to happen at the invoicing step. Okay, where well, there's a flag, we're going to see it. Um, but first, let's go to our configuration. And we have this EIS classic integration configuration. So this looks pretty simple here. Uh, let me go to, I'm hopping to the documentation, and then we'll go back and look at that. So uh, this is, you know, um, this is something where uh, it lets you set a pending threshold amount 
and then this automatic checkbox. So if automatic is checked, it's auto it says it's automatically going to flag a 600 level object code as an inventory item when invoicing a PO item in USAS. If it's left unchecked, the user um, can uh, will be prompted for five and 600 level. Uh, also, we'll see at any time they could just check this box manually too. Um, this does also specify when invoicing a PO item in USAS. I know there are districts out there that do invoicing through third party and then it posts over to USAS. Um, if that is the case and they're using inventory, there may be some additional setup that they need to do with their third party service with invoicing um, so that the items can be flagged and then come over as flagged for inventory. So uh, that is definitely an important, important thing to note uh, that this configuration is specific to when they are actually going through and creating the invoice in USAS. From everything I've heard though, the third parties that um, do the invoicing, like I believe, you know, from what I've heard, there is set up and it can still, you know, check it for inventory. So, so there should be an option there. Um, it's just different. <laughs> so, okay. So for invoicing and use as, um, come in here and uh, this is the setup. I mean, basically just like a one-time setup uh, unless something changes, but we have the threshold and then we have the automatic checkbox, okay? So those things are set up. And uh, let me get back to my purchase order. So when we look at this, so see, these do have um, 600 object codes and the charges are for 6,000. So this appears that, you know, it's gonna meet, uh, that threshold. Now, when I come in here and invoice, let's give it a new one because I don't remember what all I've used. So I'm going to zoom out for this one. Remember I said some of these I'm going to zoom in and out for. You could scroll too, but well, yeah, we'll leave it here and then we'll scroll. But uh, what I could do is I could uh, come in here and um, let's just fill this one. So I'm going to check this box and fill this. And so see that puts in the full amount, that puts in full. And when I scroll over, it's this last checkbox here. It's automatically going to check that when I fill the item because I'm filling it for an amount that's higher than the threshold and it's going to check the box. So, and I believe if I do this, so I put in the amount and then um, I'm gonna tab, tab. And when I get to the status, so I entered the amount and then I did like a tab on my keyboard, it automatically checks that EIS box, okay? So um, when I do that, now that's what the automatic is saying. It's saying this met the threshold, this has a 600 object code, so when you invoice, I'm going to automatically um, check that EIS flag box. Oops. There's the scroll. Got it. Oh, there we go. I was trying to get both. Hang on. Did I save it? No. Too much clicking. <laughs> I think I actually hit escape on my keyboard in that closed because I was not thinking. Um, but that's okay. We can come in here and do this again. All right. Let's invoice. And then I'm just going to check both and fill them, but let's do this again. Um, fill and it'll check them. Now, look, I can check and uncheck these. So like if I had an item and I was like, I, you know what? I don't actually want that to be flagged for inventory. Uh, I could uncheck it. If I had one that didn't meet the, it didn't have the 600 account, I could check that. So they can manually check these if they want. Um, what this checkbox is saying is it's just marking it as an inventory item. The inventory items are then those that are going to be pulled into the pending file when they do the pull from USAS in inventory. It's specifically going to look at inventory 
items that are marked with this checkbox. Okay. Um, we definitely have had questions on this one over time. I know we have um improvements that have been requested to like move this box over. Um a way to like retroactively mark these um after the invoice process. So we have updates that we want to do to make this a little bit um, better, easier to see. The other thing to note, because it is important right now, after I save this invoice, you cannot actually see the checkbox anymore and you can't edit the checkbox. So if they are doing this, it is important to be checking it at this point or you know, if they have it set to automatic, then it'll automatically check. But that's why I want to talk about it in this training because you know, while I know there are improvements we want to make at this point in time, if they're using those, it is pretty important to like have it set up or make sure that they're checking those if they want to be. All right. The other thing, and let's just look at it here while we're um, doing this, um, that I want to talk about is the dates. Uh, Let's see. Okay. I'm going to talk about the, I know we're getting close to 10. Uh, so I just want to give you an estimate of where we're at is I'm going to talk through all the dates that we see on an invoice because the date fields on here are for different purposes, doing different things. And then I want to show um, after that, we uh, did have um, a mass change that just came out related to invoices. Um, I'm sure we'll talk about that in the release recap as well, but I'm going to actually go through and show an example of that since it's relevant to our training today. So we probably, I mean, so we'll definitely go past 10, probably I would say maybe just like 15 minutes or so, but uh, that's where we're looking at on timing. So um, again, we're recording. So if anybody has to hop out, I totally understand. Um, all right. Okay. So first dates. When we're looking at this invoice, let me zoom back in here. When we're looking at any invoice, really, um, we're seeing quite a few different fields related to dates on here. The first one, date fields. Just call date. This is your invoice date. That's what I'm going to refer to it as. Defaults to our current date. Um, when we were looking at, like, you know, that very first example where we said, can this be reopened? Um we were looking at, you know, oh, that uh, original invoice we were looking at was in February. So basically this date, this invoice date, it's going to be the posting period that it's accounted for. All right. So that is kind of like the system date that it's using. So that one is really important. Um, basically, what period is this asso associated with? And, um, you know, what will the system use to track the timing of this invoice? Next, we have the vendor invoice date. This is optional. Uh, generally, this I believe is used by the district for tracking the date that is actually on the invoice that they get. So uh, they could type it in here. Um, again, with these dates, you can also like select. Uh, but um, that vendor invoice date, uh, they could just enter in so that they have that to track. The payment due date, again, optional. Uh, this um, is something, so my understanding is used by districts uh, to group invoices for posting. So the payment due date is going to show on the payables grid. Uh, so that can be something where if they're going to be entering invoices and maybe they're doing a check run on Wednesday and one on Friday, they could enter in a payment due date. Like I'm going to put this one in for Wednesday's date then I could just turn around and do the next invoice, but then enter a different payment due date. That way, when they get to the payables grid, they could filter that grid per the check runs they intend to do. So it's really not like doing anything. It's not going to, um, you know, make it so that they have to do it that way, but it's a way that they can use that information, use that field as an informational field to filter on to help themselves out. The uh, last one here is the created date. So the created date, you see this is grayed out. We can't, actually, I'm sorry, lie. this isn't the last one, but the last one in the header <laughs> is uh, the created date. 
And uh, we can't fill this out. This is going to actually just stamp this invoice with today's date to show that this is when it was actually created in the software. And here's the last one. It's on the items received date at the bottom here. So this, they can enter this in again, um, enter in a date here. Uh, if they don't enter one in, then it's going to default to the invoice date. It will fill it out with the invoice date. Okay. Um, one, the main reason that we get asked about the receive date is because that is relevant for the account payable report. Uh, the account payable report does run, it looks at those receive dates specifically in this field to generate that report. Um, basically, uh, when this is relevant is it's around the end of the fiscal year. So like right now, um, and uh, basically, um, trying to think of a simple, trying to make sure I say this right more so, is when they're looking at that report, it's basically like uh, they're trying to look for um, invoices, I believe, that were received before the end of the fiscal year, but that were paid um, after, or maybe it's the opposite. Um, it, that If you look at that account payable report, there's a description of exactly how that report runs, but it's basically got to do with when they're paying invoices, when they have invoices that um, are sort of like invoicing carried over and paid um, and have that fiscal year boundary, they want to track those. So um, when they do that, the date on the invoice may be a different period than what the receive date is because, you know, it actually depends on like what period they're in, what period they want to post the invoice and post the disbursement in. But for tracking purposes, they want that receive date, okay? Uh, the reason that I'm bringing this up is because if they leave this blank and it defaults to the invoice date, that's not always what they want. Um, in some cases, we've had it where they want the receive date to default to the vendor invoice date. And there is a rule for that. So that is an option. Um, that is also in the um, optional rules and like the bundled but not mandatory. So uh, that could be an option. Uh, they can manually enter the receive date um, or yes, or then those would be the, the two options for a defaulting invoice date without any um, rules or vendor invoice date with any rules. And then if it's blank, it would default. So we'll save that. See uh, my second one here. It defaulted to my invoice date. Okay. So with that said, let me grab this. Now we're going to be on our invoice grid, okay? And so in this case, uh, talking that through, you know, the receive date is something that we care about, right? So um, what we've had uh, with because of that situation, because, you know, sometimes that receive date, they're like, it defaulted to the invoice date, and then they actually wanted it to be something different to make sure it can appropriately like pull on reports and show. So what we're gonna say is in this case, we had this invoice and our receive dates are in June, but we actually want to mark them for, uh, let's mark them for um, May, okay? Let's mark them for May. And so uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the new mass change that was added for this. Uh, I have my mass change icon up here. And um, in our system modules, mass change is turned on. So anytime you're going to use mass change, you have to have it turned on first. So it's already turned on here. I have mass change. What I'm going to do is go to our documentation. We're going to go to the appendix and useful procedures. Okay, appendix, useful procedures, mass change. And downloadable mass change definitions. 
again, this is brand new. So um, I'm sure we'll talk about this more in the future, but change invoice item receive dates. So this is something that um, is just coming out uh, right here. Click here to download the definition. So if this is something that you want to use, um, it's something that you come out to the wiki, you're going to click here to download it. I guess I'll just download from here. Boom, I have it. And then I'm going to come to my software. And uh, so in my mass change import definition, we'll go ahead and click that um, update invoice item receive date from SSDT. We'll save that. And now if you see up here in our definitions, I have it. So I only have to import it the first time. If you've already, like if you import it and then you want to use it again in the future, it'll still be there. In order to use it, what I want to do is go to execution. And let me just zoom out a little bit here. Um, but what we're seeing is, see, look at up here, as with any mass change, anything on this grid, it's going to change. So let me just put in my invoice number because I'm just going to do it for this one that we just um, created. So I'm just going to filter the grid down to only be the invoices that I want to impact. In this case, one invoice will be modified. It is going to change the receive date on all of the items for that invoice though. Okay. So I had two items on this invoice and it is going to change both of them. You know, even though I'm seeing like the, cause it's the one invoice with two items attached. Okay. And then what we do here is we can put in, put in the date that we want to change the receive date to. Okay. All right, before we make the change, one more thing I want to say. The invoice date, because the invoice date is the date of the period that my invoice is being accounted for. This invoice is in June, which is open, so I can modify this. I can make a change on it. Um, the invoice date does have to be in an open period. The, per the um, invoice that I'm making a change to must be in an open period. So this is June, that's fine, June's open. The receive date on the items, when we were looking at that, it's an informational field. So because this invoice is already in an open period, it's okay that I can put this, I could put this date in any, I, I can make any date I want because this isn't changing the invoice date of it. This is changing an informational date, okay? So let us let me make the change and I'll show you what I mean. All right, so there's our change. Now let's look at this. And so the receive date is 5124. Okay. So again, my invoice, this is still a still a June invoice. I just changed what date I said that that was received as of. So and you know, I apologize. I hope it wasn't too confusing talking about the accounts payable report. That one is difficult to um difficult to talk out a little bit when you have if you have that situation if you have someone running that report and they're not seeing what they expect to see generally um what i would do is um go you know look for the invoices um is kind of sort of compare invoices to uh their received dates um again usually it's the ones that are right around the fiscal year and um, uh, you can definitely let us know too. We can we can help you look at that. But this one, you know, so I think that this will probably come up with like a pretty specific situation where it's like, you know, why aren't certain things showing? And then, you know, locating the invoices that need to be changed. Um, and at least this gives an option to update those because sometimes we see invoices that have a whole lot of line items on them. <laughs> and so um, at least if you can use this mass change, it can update everything on one invoice at once. All right. Okay, well, um, that is all I have for um, invoices today. 
Uh, again, just to recap, this mass change was in the appendix in the useful procedures section. Uh, and then our other uh, place that, you know, I was highlighting today is our appendix FAQs. Um, so that is uh, another good go-to for invoicing things. Um, but yes, thank you for attending today. And um, I'll go ahead and wrap up here. Um, I hope everyone has a great weekend. Um, when the Zoom meeting ends, it is going to pop up and uh, have a link to the survey. So if you like this training, if you have any other ideas for future trainings, please fill that out and let us know. Um, but yes, happy Friday, everyone. Thanks for attending. We'll see you on the next one. Thank you.